because obviously when we're talking about leadership, there are so many different approaches you can take to it, and all of us have taken our own unique approach to leadership and what to do with it and how to develop it. And our marvelous Liz will tell us later how to make our fortune from it. And in the meantime, before we can make our fortune from being effective leaders, effective is a strong word here, it's important to go back and look at how do we claim and own our own leadership. Extremely, extremely powerful. Because we are all born leaders. Leadership is not a skill that's given to a few. Every one of us have it, and the way to start claiming it is to claim leadership in your own life. All right? And what I'm going to do today is some of the work that has been done by an amazing man that I have come to know and studied with, Lance Sefferton. And as with all of the things I've done with dozens of years, in education is try to find the most effective and most efficient way to present material. And Lance has done this in a fantastic way you have on your handouts, the why, the be, and the do. And I will take his work and share that with you because I find it immensely profound. All right? So let's take a look first at your why. We've discussed it in two different approaches, with two different phenomenal speakers, each presenting it from their own way. I will bring in mine and show you my perspective on this. My approach to most everything I do is immensely spiritual and immensely pragmatic. Because I think we need to combine, we're about my beliefs, my faith system, we're embodied souls, or embodied essences, whatever you're comfortable with. So there's very much a spiritual element to us, but an immensely pragmatic element that we have to deal with and work with all the time, all right? So that being the case, let's take a look at this. Your why. Your why is what absolutely feeds your heart. It feeds your soul. It allows you to know why you're here. You know, there's someone that says uh, frequently, the two best days of your life are the day you're born and the day you find out why. And so many people that I've worked with, I have been, for those who don't know me, I was a therapist for over 30 years. My doctorate is in psychology. So I was a therapist for over 30 years and I've been a coach for about eight years. And so I have worked with so many, many people wondering about their why as if this was some nebulous, esoteric thing <laughs> that there was no way to discover. And what I have found out is that with most everything in life, there's a very pragmatic, way to discover your why. And the most pragmatic way of doing this is go back and take a look at your history. Why are you living? What is it that fills you with passion? Why do you think you came here? And the most important way to discover that simply is to recognize that we came here to teach what we came here to learn. And as you look over your life, what is the major life lesson you have learned through your journey? I would like to take you back a little bit to look at that and do it if you can without drama or trauma. <laughs> Drama or trauma is a perspective that has nothing to do with reality. It is an overreaction to your history or to an event. I raise my kids to know that we have little problems and we have big problems, but we never have a crisis. <clears throat> All right, life is a gift and on occasion problems show up and they're either gonna be a small problem or a big problem. And I don't say that because I was born with a very easy life. I spent my first three years in an orphanage. I was a product of an affair, and I was left in an orphanage. And when I was three, I was adopted by an Irish alcoholic cop from South Boston. 
And my father wanted to adopt me when he found out there was an Irish girl in an orphanage because they don't belong there. All right, and I still have, I believe, a small Boston accent, so you may know this morning. But believe it or not, when I get together with friends, it's a wee bit bigger. Right. <laughs> so a wee bit of the Brogue and a wee bit of the, the, the Boston accent. But in any event, when my dad adopted me and brought me back to the projects to live with them, it was with my mother, her mother, and an older brother and a younger sister. So I moved into an existing family already. But the reality is my mother and grandmother did not want me in that house. Only my father did. So what took place is that my father would get me up at 5.30 in the morning and put me in a sunsuit or a snowsuit depending upon the weather. And in doing that, he would then give me breakfast, put me outside in a playpen where I would stay until 9.30 at night after my grandmother went to bed. Then he would come out and get me, bring me in and give me dinner and put me to bed to get me out of the house before she get up in the morning. So she never saw, as a good Irish woman, she never saw an illegitimate child in her home. All right? You can look at this and you, again, look, let's take out the drama and the trauma. All right? So that's just the facts of the journey. So as we're looking at the why and you look at your life, what does that look like? And at six, my grandmother fell down and broke her hip and I was allowed to live in that house. Once I moved into that house, by then I had more brothers. But once I moved back into that house, I discovered my father was a sadist. He believed Irish stick together, which is why you don't belong in an orphanage. But he was an Irish alcoholic caught with a gun. And so hospital visits were not uncommon, okay? This was my journey, this was my story. And it ended up being that because I was blessed by not living in that house for the first six years, I wasn't a part of the dynamic. And not being a part of the dynamic, when I finally could live there and see the insanity, and the others had been so beaten down, they didn't have the strength. But I came in, and I, at six, took them on. <laughs> so when he was beating or whipping one of my brothers or sisters or my mother, and I would yell at him and say, drop them, I'm mad at you, then he would come after me, but I knew I was strong enough to take it. And he would say, I'm going to break you the way they break horses. And yet I knew my brothers and sisters and my mother would be OK. okay. You have to look at what's your why, <clears throat> all right? And what he discovered for me, one of the gifts he gave me, was the strongest thing in the world is tell me I can't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're going to break me? Watch this. Mm -hmm. And God bless his soul. <clears throat> what he said often is that, when you were from the projects, you belong in the projects, and you'll never get out. If you get out, you betray the Irish, and you betray the projects. And you also learn the violence in the house, the projects, frequently. We have gangs on every street corner. And so you learn not to walk on the sidewalk because you don't want to walk in somebody else's territory. So you walk to school, you walk where you're going on the street, because it's safer. Okay? It's a different world, different reality. But when you look at what's the why, I was taught it was impossible to leave the projects. I was taught it was impossible to be accepted when you're illegitimate. I was taught that it is impossible to have a dream other than my father wanted me married to one of our own, which was Michael Daniel Flaherty. <laughs> I was with Marty McNamara, and that didn't work out very well. Because <laughs> <laughs> in old Irish families, the firstborn boy goes to the priesthood. So Marty and I had as much fun as we could before he went to the priesthood, <laughs> and then we moved on. We have principles that we move on. But just take a look at what is the why about. My why became anything is possible. My life lesson was that nothing is possible when you're who you are. So what would I come here to learn? The exact opposite. That anything is possible. But it is only possible if you take ownership and leadership 
in your own life. And when you look back over your lives, this is just a story. When you look back over your story, what was the lesson you came here to learn? That is your why. And we've got hundreds of lessons if we truly worked. Mm -hmm. But there's one key lesson that has been yours. So what was the life lesson you learned? Because that's what you're here to teach. How you do it is almost irrelevant because that keeps shifting and changing. Mm -hmm. But the why, when you live that why, you wake up in the morning filled with joy, filled with excitement, filled with the realization that this journey is a gift and it's yours. All right? So when I decided I wanted out, I was going to leave the projects, I was leaving something, even if it meant betraying the world, and I wanted to apply to college, and Dad didn't believe in educating girls. He had several sons to educate. So I said, I'll go to nursing school. I applied to nursing school. And when I applied to nursing school, found out my high school was an inner city unaccredited school. And so therefore, I could not go to nursing school anywhere in the United States. Another, it's impossible, it can't happen, because your high school was unaccredited, mm -hmm. even though I got all A's and B's. Study was never difficult for me, thank God, other than chemistry and languages. <laughs> Whatever God gave, many other gifts, so that's not mine, all right? Know your gifts, know your limitations. So therefore, I couldn't do it. And I couldn't go to college, couldn't go to nursing school, and I wanted to be a social worker. I wanted to support people. I thought through nursing, I could help people, all right? I helped kept my mother and father, my brother and brothers and sisters, everybody alive. I will continue to keep people alive but it wasn't going to happen. So I went and I thought I applied to the Sisters of Mercy because they do social work. There was one part of Southie had the Sisters of Mercy, I'll do social work. I went down and applied to the Sisters of Mercy, found out the Catholic Church doesn't allow illegitimate children in the convent. Okay, again, it's not possible. So what, it, what for you was your message? Notice how the message kept coming and coming and coming. It's not possible. It's whatever your message is, you got it. You got it again and again and again. I believe the way the universe works, the way spirit works, whatever your faith system is, is you keep getting it until you get it. Mm -hmm. And once you get it, it doesn't happen anymore. All right? A light bulb just went off. <laughs> Notice that. You keep getting it. Some of us learn by being touched by a feather. Some of us learn when we're touched by a small slap. Some of us need a two by four. <laughs> All right? Notice learning by a two by four is your choice. You don't need to be hit by a two by four on a regular basis to get the message. That's an option you have. And so one of the sisters said to me, Dorothy, uh, are you gonna be marrying Michael? I said, I guess I am, Sister Alice, because I can't get out. I tried college, I tried nursing school, and I tried the Sisters of Mercy. She said, why on earth would you want to become a nun? You're continuously in detention. I would think you would be tired of us. You know? And I said, well, it was the only way I know how to get out. So she and my parish priest wrote to a thousand communities around the globe. They heard from one community in Quebec. And they said, we deal with prostitutes. We are willing to take a risk on an illegitimate child. Mm -hmm. They weren't under the Pope, they were under local bishops, so they had no leniency. So a young girl from Boston with a slight bro, who kind of used to hang with the Aces and the Saints and the Mustangs and whatever gang your boyfriend is in is the gang you belong to. Since girls don't define the gang, you go where your boyfriend is. Mm -hmm. I like variety, we did a number of different <laughs> okay. So this is how it goes. So take a look at this. I now went to the sisters, the English translation is the Sister Service of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, but in America they call the Good Shepherd Sisters. And as a Good Shepherd Sister with a long black habit on, I have another talk that I do, Five Steps to Claiming Your Dreams, and in that I have pictures of me in my habit and all of these things, I love all right? But um, She's with that, with that, noticing that with this long black habit on, Mother Superior said, Sister, I'm sending you to college. I said, Mother, they won't let me in. She goes, if I send you, Sister, they will let you in. And by the grace of God, mother sent me to college. I got a basic education. You get an undergraduate degree, and nobody cares where you went to high school. So going on and getting my master's, getting my PhD, it just gave <coughs> more money and more time. 
but anything was possible once I had that undergraduate education. So take a look. What would my why be? It is absolutely about letting others know there is no such thing as impossibility. The greatest piece is are you willing to pay the price? And most people do not want to pay the price of having their why. So they go through life surviving. They go through life playing victim. They go through life playing powerless. I wish I could, but I can't. There is nothing that you wish you could, but you can't. When I left religious life, um, years later, I was in for a number of years, I left religious life, went back to Southie, and my girlfriends were um, either in prison or working the streets, making money, good money, what we thought, or they were on welfare and living in the projects. So I found out I had nothing in common with them. I had been a social worker, I was college educated, I had nothing in common, so I did the logical step for me. I moved to Manhattan, became an international airline stewardess. <laughs> All right? And I wanted to become a stewardess, so what did I do? I picked up the yellow pages and called, contacted every single airline in the yellow pages, and they would say, you need a passport if you want to fly for Aer Lingus or Alitalia, and I said, well, I'll go buy a passport. Where do you buy one? I had never been out of Southie in Dorchester, which is a local area, other than to go in religious life. So what do I know about passports? They haven't ever sold. I'd never been on an airplane. I just thought being an airline student was really good. I went to here, a great way to see the world. Mm -hmm. And so I would just buy a passport until I found out you can't, you have to live in a country to have the passport that goes with that country. Take a look at the innocence and naivete so many of us have when we walk into a world we do not know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't care who you are, there are so many worlds we do not know. And we need to recognize the fact that it is a stupidity, it is naiveness, it is innocence. So we walk into different worlds. Are we willing to take the risk of saying, I know nothing about this? Are we willing to say, I want to grow? Are we willing to say, you know so much more than I? If I'm supposed to be perfect or all intelligent, I will never get to live my why. I will never get to be who I am. So take a step back and look at this. Can you see how this is a consistent message, a consistent pattern for every one of us? Mm -hmm. You need to be willing to look at yours, taking all the victim, the illusions of victim out, taking the illusions of powerlessness out, taking the illusions out of it. You may have been caught off guard in a situation or a child innocent in a situation, but never a victim. That is a mindset that keeps you small. We are called to be bigger than life. We are not called to be small. So my why becomes anything is possible. Absolutely anything is possible. And when you look at that and you see your why and you recognize that it isn't can I live it, you have no choice but to live it. It's almost as if your why chooses you, and yet it becomes a byproduct of the life you've walked. And if you don't know why you're here, my question to you is why is it you are afraid to see that? Will your why cause you to change your life? Will your why cause you to shift what you are doing? And will it force you to begin to live your life and not survive it? Because if you take a look at this, what has been your greatest life lesson and what is your takeaway? Your greatest life lesson shakes you at the core of your being. It absolutely does. And when you live it, it feeds you daily. We need food. This is our soul's food. This is our heart's food. We have no choice if we are truly to live and not survive to live our why because that is what feeds us. And it also lets you know that you alone are the one who defines your life. You are the one who defines your story. And if you can look at your past without judgment and illusion and live in your present, 
You're now in a place where you can absolutely live the present <coughs> and the future. Your story defines it. And how can we live our lives without passion, without spirituality? And I'm not even talking about religion or faith as such. But we're spiritual beings. And if you take a look at the major world leaders, who are we looking at? We are looking at Buddha. We are looking at Mohammed. We are looking at Christ. We are looking at Gandhi. And all of these people, and I know there are many women out there, we just don't celebrate them, but all of these men that we're looking at, they were contemplatives and they were activists. So again, they have both sides of this. They, were, they took the time to sit in reflection. They took the time for introspection. They took the time for meditation. Or now the, the buzzword is mindfulness. They took the time to sit in mindfulness. They took the time to be present in their lives, in their own bodies, in their own connection to their own soul. And from that inner connection, every one of them began to change the world. This is so much bigger than our political leaders. So much bigger than the heads of corporations. We're talking about people who have transformed this planet. And if you listen to the message of every one of them who followed their why, they discovered within themselves what their ministry was. They discovered within themselves what their purpose was. Contemporary, look at Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> look at Jackie Kennedy. Mm -hmm. They knew their why. And it was so much bigger than them. But because they lived their why, they had the passion, they had the spiritual connection, and they had the absolute joy in living their journey because they were living their why. And I truly believe for every one of us, if we live our why, that joy is intrinsic. Yes, we have moments of depression. Yes, we have moments of, of feeling lost or of feeling abandoned. Welcome to the human condition. But those are things we experience. It's not where we live. When you're living your why, you will experience all of the human condition. But it has nothing to do with where you live in your energetic reality. And that energetic reality is what defines what you're putting out into the world. You know, we addressed it br briefly this morning, that your energy is what it impacts. Maya Angelou said, people don't remember what you said, they remember how you made them feel. And a woman of wisdom, she also took the time for inner reflection. For years after her rape and incests, she was in absolute silence. She took the time to live the inner life. And from the inner life came out with immense wealth of wisdom. All right? Because we take the time for the inner world, introspection, for personal growth, for self-awareness, we have the ability to live out there in a way that's dramatically different. Once you know your why, the next question is, who do you want to be? This is a big one. This isn't just... And we see so many people that would come in to me for therapy. Well, I am 18 year olds. I have an 18 year old boy come in and see me. And I said, well, tell me what you want to do. Well, I am who I am. Oh, oh. oh darling, you're 18. <laughs> you haven't even begun being who you are. Oh. You don't have a clue who you are yet. You're 18. Until you've made enough mistakes, yeah. until you've lived mm -hmm. enough life, until you've failed enough times, mm -hmm. you don't know who you are. You are just beginning. So don't ever think I'm done. We are in process until the day we go home. We will always be in process. So who do you want to be? Who is it that you want to become? And again, we need introspection to discover all of this. Each dream you have calls you to become more and more of who you are meant to be. In the back of the room, I have four books I wrote. The first one, the backdrop, is my autobiography. Not everything is in there, some of the things we want this book published and out there <laughs> and I pray a great deal that was all about the prayers I didn't put in there okay but then there's also a workbook to go with it so you look inside and discover your own dreams 
But I truly believe that every dream we have supports us in becoming the man or woman we are supposed to be. If you can imagine when you have a dream here to go to college, just to pick something simple, you find a college you can get into that lets you have a teaching degree. And then you go up this cliff that you start walking up this heavy, heavy, deep, deep, steep, steep mountain of four years of school, four years of classes, <clears throat> four years of life experiences, so that the man or woman that graduates from college is not the child that began college. So once you get out of college and you now go into the classroom, you may realize, oh my God, <laughs> this isn't me. You did not make a mistake. You discovered a you you never knew about when you got out of high school. You realized you can work your buns off. Mommy and dad are not there at night making sure you did your homework. You worked your buns off to get that degree. You worked your buns off to make choices between partying or studying. Between now, you see with our freshmen, God bless their little souls, they're out there sleeping with everybody under the sun and drinking all the beer they can because they finally have a chance to drink beer and not have to go home from their parents, all right? But then as sophomore year comes, there's a little more wisdom. There's a little more discernment. And then junior year, even more, they're realizing, oh my God, I'm gonna be out of here soon. And by senior year, as we come more and more into who we are, we discovered who do we want to be. I want to be somebody who gets to where it is I want to go. I want to be somebody who's willing to pay the price of achieving my goal. That's who I want to be. And you've discovered that by following a dream. And now when you're up at the top of this cliff and you're realizing teaching isn't it, you're at a vista you never had down here. And from this vista, you get to see opportunities and possibilities you never knew were possible. And that's where we go back into, are you willing to take the risk? Because if you take a risk, you will become more of you than you are today. If you play it safe, you don't stagnate. If you say, stay safe, you have to work harder and harder to stay small. Because you're in such a level of self-betrayal so that you don't get in your own way, that you have to get smaller and smaller and smaller. So there is no stagnation. You're here and you either grow or you regress. And from here, it means I have to jump off this cliff and get ready for the next dream. So every time you start another dream, it's up another higher mountain to get the top to a higher vista than you had last time. And continuously, if you can see this, if you can follow this, as you follow your dreams, you continuously become more and more of the person you were meant to be. Because this is about being. And it's at this point where you recognize I can be somebody who is angry and bitter because everybody else had an easy time. I can be somebody who is angry and bitter because nobody knows the struggles I have seen. Really, <laughs> you're right. And that person's struggles over there are the gifts that are defining for them who do they want to become. They'll be different than yours, but they will be there. And there are some people who have had a great easy, easy life but let me tell you, I've worked with those. When they're 38 and they hit their first obstacle, they have no skill set in how to work with it because life has been a wonderful slide. So now at 38, they have to catch up with 38 years worth of life lessons that they didn't take the time to learn. There is no easy, there is simple. And I've told my students for years, Life is simple, but it is not always easy. We as a human species try to make it convoluted and complicated, but life is very simple, it just isn't always easy. So who do you want to be? Who do you want to become? That's absolutely up to you. But notice this, as you keep achieving dreams, as you keep going for it, notice a new part of you comes out with every dream you go for. Notice a new part of you comes out because you learn lessons you didn't learn before. You recognize strengths in you you didn't know you had. You recognize vulnerabilities you didn't know were getting in your way. So every time you follow a dream, you learn more and more. And if you take time for meditation or reflection or contemplation, 
whatever word you choose to put on that, you begin to integrate all of the life lessons in your journey. And once you integrate all of those life lessons in your journey, you begin to realize, I'm becoming somebody. I'm becoming a man or woman I can be so absolutely proud of. I am becoming a man or woman who can fall in love with myself. And when you can begin to fall in love with yourself, you begin to recognize the gift you are bringing to you and to the people in your world. And eventually when we get to the do, the gift you are bringing and transforming the world itself. But in order to define who it is I want to be now that I know my why, I've got to take that risk of following every dream within me. And noticing that some of them work out beautifully. Some of them don't work out quite the way we want it. But what happens is that whenever you take it, wherever it leads, it may lead to a job loss, it may lead to a relationship ending, it can lead to a divorce, it can lead to bankruptcy. But you know what? You stand up, you brush it off, you take some time to grieve because grieving is healthy. You take time to grieve and then you move on to the next. And that helps define who is it you want to be. I know I want to be a very powerful woman. I don't put that in terms of a job position, in terms of status. But I know I want to be a leader in my life. I want to be vibrant. I want to be powerful. I absolutely want to be holy and spiritual. Because without my spirituality, my life is empty. But I also want a vast sense of humor. Life is meant to be lived with laughter and joy and good red wine. Okay? It is not meant to be survived. So notice, who do you want to be? And if you know, just think about this, if you want to be vibrant and alive and happy, and I spent a week waking up miserable and grumpy, guess who's in self-betrayal? Why? What belief have you hooked onto that isn't your truth? What have you hooked onto that doesn't define you? Because the truth is, it always works out. This particular dream taught you what you needed to learn. This particular dream took you into a you you didn't know existed. It's just time to let it go. And again, some of us get these little touches. Some of us have to get a slap, but some it's a two by four. <laughs> I guess I knew it was time to move on, and I've known it for a year and a half and didn't realize it until the building burned down. I guess I'm moving now. <laughs> okay, settle. It may not have had to move. You know, it didn't have to burn down if you moved a whole lot faster. But it will take place because this is a spiritual journey, and it's going to go the way it's going to go. After you then know what your why is, who it is you want to be, now it is your turn to define what it is you want to do and how are you going to do it. Do not get caught up in perfection. No such thing exists. My dad's idea of perfection changed every single day. So you could try to be perfect for dad, but it was dad's perfect yesterday, today his perfect looks different. <laughs> And if you've been to high school or college, you know this teacher's idea of exactly what they want you to do has nothing to do with what that teacher wants you to do. So you have to learn to adapt to the different teachers because each one has a different way of seeing perfect. Each one has a different way of seeing what is supposed to be done so that they know you have the material. So let go of what it's supposed to look like. Let go of what it is you are supposed to do Sebostas are built on betrayal. Simply find out what they want. And if I want this degree, if I want this job, I have to, this is what they want me to do. Can I be in integrity and do this? And if I can't be in integrity and do this, then I either have to find another way to do it elsewhere or I have to make my own way. Those of us who have chosen to be entrepreneurs, we finally said, I guess I'll make my own way. 
because it doesn't work doing it somebody else's way. Right. But notice this. But what that means is I know who I want to be. I want to be an independent. How am I going to do that? I'm going to do my own company. So my B becomes my do. So take a look at this. Your Y and your B define what it is you do in the world. And to be really successful at what you're doing means I really know my why. I really know who I want to be. And so now I can really do my do and my transformation of the world. When we get uncertain, it's because we've lost touch with our why or our be. It isn't about the do. We've lost touch with our why or our be. So do a quick review of your life. What are your do's? And every one of us has a series. We're all over 16, so we've had more than one, one do in our life. Okay. So, look at how nice and charitable I am. Okay. All right, I was raised to be a good girl. It hasn't worked out well, but I'm still on it. So take a look at this. We've all had many, many do's. When I was in religious life, I worked as a social worker, and I worked in people who were in-house, people who were in residential treatment. My do was to teach them that this didn't have to define their life. These girls could go on and become anything they wanted. So I worked with the girls. Now, it got me into a wee bit of trouble because many of these girls would wear dark navy eyeshadow and they'd have dark red lips and dark red cheeks, looks like clowns to me. And I would teach them how to put on subtle makeup to look really good. And Mother Superior would say, Sister James Marie, I want to know how you know how to do that. I don't know what to tell you, Mother, because we had no, we could not read magazines, we had no newspapers, no television, no radio, mm. all right? And we could only visit lay people one hour a month. Our parents could visit us one hour a month. That's the only time we could be with lay people. So somehow I knew how to do all these things, and I can't say I wasn't quite a good girl in high school. So I just, I don't know, I just learned it. <laughs> <laughs> but Sister James, we don't put makeup on young girls. Mother, if I don't do it, they're gonna do it. It will look much better if I do it. <laughs> Sister James? Yes, mother. You can see why I'm out here. <laughs> <laughs> I only could do that for so long. Okay, so here we go. Look at that, but, but my, my do, living my why in religious life. I left and then I moved into New York City, became an international airline stewardess. And it's amazing, and people found out, here we are, in my day we were sex symbols. You would walk into the airport, and it was like Moses in the Red Sea. Yeah. <laughs> just divided and all turned to stare at the stewardesses. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. You know, with our hats and our gloves, and put your hat up, baby, you're not one of us. <laughs> all right? We did it. It was another whole world. But what happened there, my why? People found out I was an ex-nun, and so many times I'd be in the galley, and the curtains would close. Abortions, affairs, oh. all the things oh. these people were suffering yes. through, they would come to me for confession. And I'd say, priest, do confession. But you're a nun, it's the same thing. Sure, keep the curtain closed. We can do this. And be there to let them know anything is possible. Anything is possible. You had an affair? because you're looking for love. Find it from somebody who deserves you. It is possible to find that. You had an abortion, now you feel guilty. You made a choice that felt like the only choice. Breathe, let it go. You've learned something. How can you protect yourself next time? Breathe. The Spirit, God, will always love you unconditionally. Let it go and move on. Again, teaching anything is possible. We are always loved. We are always wanted. Always teaching again. And then leaving, leaving the airlines and staying home for a few years as a mom and a wife. And then being divorced and my children were very little and I needed to do something to support my babies. Their father had many interests and so it was going to be my job to support my children getting my master's and becoming a therapist, where I was told there is a glut of therapists in Hartford. You'll never have more than 20 patients a week. It's not gonna happen. I said, I have to support my children. 
well, <coughs> then I have to think about something else. But I spent three months speaking to every church group, synagogue group, every woman's group, every book club, and within three months I was seeing 42 patients a week, and for 17 years I had a six-month waiting list. I loved what I did. When you love what you do, guess what people want to be around? Yeah. People who are doing what they love. People who are living their why, they are becoming who they want to be, and people want to be with you. People work with you when you exude the passion they want in their lives. People work with you when you exude the love they want to experience. People work with you, and they will wait six months to work with you. When you are you, when you are living your why, when you are living your purpose, that allows you to do and help change the world from your own core, from your own center. You are living your why, your be, and your do. Look at this. This is what we're meant to do, and there's no right way to do this. I've done it many ways. I did it in religious life. I did it in the airlines, and then as a therapist. And I had a reputation, and they still waited in line. Do not work with Dr. Dorothy unless you want to grow. She doesn't buy victim. She doesn't buy I wish I could. She doesn't buy it wasn't my fault. That's a lot of garbage. That's you refusing to own your own leadership. You refusing to own the leadership in your own life. All right? Once you own the leadership in your own life, it happened because I was really not quick when I brought this person into my life. It happened because I took a job I hated just because I wanted to make money immediately. You can always find a job to make money immediately. My feeling is, worst case scenario, I go back, I become a waitress, push up bra, I get a studio apartment, I decorate with class, <laughs> and life will go on. <laughs> there's nothing, there's nothing that we can't do. It may not work out the way we want, but it will work out. That's up to you. How do you want it to look? What do you want to do? Take a risk. Worst case scenario is still pretty darn good. And when you know that, you're not frightened of taking risks. When you know that, you do it. And so in doing that, I did this as a stew. And then I did it as a therapist. I did my anything is possible. If you were willing to work with me in those days as a therapist, I won't buy, I'm a victim, I won't buy, I'm powerless, I won't buy. I had a woman, 63 years old, come in and see me, and I said to her, tell me about yourself. And she said, I'm an incest survivor. And I said, I'm so sorry that happened to you. Tell me something else. She goes, you don't understand. I'm an incest survivor. Oh. I said, I, I'm truly sorry that happened to you. But what else have you done with your life? You don't get it. Mm. This woman will be an incest survivor till she's 95 or whenever she goes home. That was an experience that was horrible when it happens to you. I know this world, you know. It's horrible when it happens to you. But it happened to you. It isn't you. It isn't your why. It isn't your be. It isn't your do. So when that's an identity you take on that betrays you, you never get to live all of this. You never get to live your why, your be, and your do. You never get to become the person you're meant to be. Therefore, your gifts don't get to change the world because you are too busy stuck in an image that is about self-betrayal because it has nothing to do with who you are. You see how this works? Mm -hmm. yeah. Again, life is very simple. It just isn't always easy for any of us, all right? So take a look at this. All these positions are the same. And now as, as a mentor, as a coach for women leaders, anything is possible. And I work with so many different types of people. One of my women is, is head of a, a merging conglomerate that is now the division of a global organization. And she had to merge. She saw herself as a president CEO of her company, except what happened is her company merged, and all of a sudden this major global organization merged her with four other companies. And now it's like, oh, this is beyond my YB and do here, okay? <laughs> Do you want it to be beyond your why being do? Or does it just feel that way at the moment? I want it to be, it just doesn't feel right. So let's look at this, let's work with this. I've worked with her now about six months, and about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, she was named one of the top 40 women leaders of New York City. Wow. All right? She could do it, but she needed to want to do it. 
And once you want it to do it, anything is possible. Dallin, if this is what you want, I will help you get there. And when they named her, she put me down as her strategic partner to support her getting to this position. She could do it because she wanted to take that ownership of that level of leadership because she knew this was a risk. This was a jump off a very big cliff, but she wanted it. It was her choice. She could have played small. We always have this choice of playing small or we have this choice of going big. What do we want to do? How much of us do we want to become? All right, how much of us do we want to share with the world? And as she develops leadership, we will go into a minute to another whole level, she's creating a completely different culture in her companies. And now all of these companies are one company. So it's a whole other level. So notice this, what I'm doing, the same message from working in residential treatment from the ear lines, from <coughs> being a mom, from being a therapist, from being a coach. I've been doing the same thing in dramatically different venues. And yet notice for you, when you've done your due, if you go back in reflection and contemplation, meditation, whatever you choose to do and look at your life, you've done the same do in a different context, in a different venue, every time. But if you've truly lived you, this is what you've come here to do. This is how you've come here to transform the world. And folks, the world needs those of us who are connected to our purpose. Because there are too many people out there connected to status and power over. Our culture is in a very sad place because greed has overtaken love. Because fear has overtaken peace and presence. All right? When we create an us and a them, we are in betrayal. Betrayal of self and betrayal of the world. Us and them creates a betrayal because we are all in this together. We are all one. We are all brothers and sisters. And when we live in that, we've done it. So take a look at this. You're due. There is one message that you've lived with. One purpose you have had. And no, in doing this, when you were not at home with you, how did you betray yourself? I would if I could, but I can't. I don't know how to do this. I'm all by myself. I'm out here alone. Notice that the worst kind of loneliness, the worst kind of feeling of abandonment is self-abandonment. When we are in self-abandonment, we can look at the whole world as rejecting us, when the truth is we've rejected us. And when we reject us, nobody can be there for us. We can't even find us. How are they going to do that? <laughs> All right? So the worst kind of betrayal is self-betrayal. How many times do you say yes when you mean no? How many times do you say no because you're frightened of taking a risk? And no, the way it works, the universe will keep coming at you again and again and again <laughs> until you get it. A friend of mine said to me a couple weeks ago, she said to me, why are all my clients um, having difficulty understanding me? And the next day she said, why are my kids, why is everybody having difficulty understanding me? What's wrong with the world? Nobody's understanding me. <laughs> we could reframe this. <laughs> All right? We could reframe this, love. Because okay? I'm not understanding the question. Let's back this up. Look at that. These are, these are options. These are options. Notice this. How do you limit yourself? If your do isn't working, how are you limiting yourself? How small have you made you? How small have you made your possibilities? How small have you made the world in relationship to you? Because this is what's happened, and we've all been there. Accept mm -hmm. your humanity, folks. <laughs> we have all done this to ourselves. The difference is some of us live here, some of us visit here. The choice is yours. You can live in this place or visit here. And do not pretend for a second, especially to me, 
I happen to have a wee bit of skill. I see energy flows in and through and around your body. <laughs> All right. I had a school for 19 years teaching a method of energy medicine I created, affiliated with 50 hospitals across the country. I'm a pioneer in the field of integrative health care in the United States. I was affiliated the only four-year program in energy medicine in the United States, affiliated with 50 hospitals across the country, where I received NIH grant funding to research work I created in this field, funded by NIH to do my doctoral dissertation in the psychological and spiritual causes of physical illness. Why that? We're back into my why, my we be, my do. Because all disease begins on an energetic level. It is a spiritual belief system. Life is hot and then you die. Think about this, if I say that, how am I doing? <laughs> All right? <laughs> Amazingly, I feel depressed or angry at the world because it's so hard. And what ends up happening? My lungs can't expand. My organs can't function. I become physically diseased. If I take leadership in my own life, and I stand up, and I breathe in, I want to look at what happened that I believed a lie. If I stand up and I look at the psychological and spiritual causes of this disorder, I can now shift the cause. I can take medication so I don't feel the disorder. Mm. Or I can go back and look at what's going on that put me in this energetic and biochemical cellular place to support the development of this disorder. And over my years as a healer, as an energy practitioner, the number of cancer clients that showed up and went away. I had one of my students come in and see me, and this is a do, again, anything is possible. And she came in and I would have the first class, I'd always have somebody up on stage with me on a massage table teaching the basic primary method of energy medicine. And I said to this one woman, I got to her bladder and I said to her, how are you feeling? She said, I'm feeling good. I said, oh, have you been to the doctors lately? She said, yes. And I said, how are you doing? And she whispered in my ear. And she said, um, I have bladder cancer. I'm going in for surgery on Monday. I said, can I tell you something? And she said, sure. I said, I am somewhat gifted. I can see your bladder. I said, you have 18 tumors around the outside of your bladder. Not one of them has penetrated the bladder wall. Your physician's going to think you're crazy, but tell him you believe you have 18 tumors on the outside of the bladder wall. She was a nurse, so she understood what I was saying. I said, but they haven't penetrated. I don't believe you need to lose your bladder. Her twin was in the class with me. Her twin called me on Wednesday and said, Dr. Dorothy, my sister had her surgery, and I said, tell me how she's doing. She had 18 tumors on the outside of her bladder, but they saved her bladder. She wants to work with you when she gets out of the hospital. Bladder issues in the Eastern world, water element, is about fear. Kidney disease, fear around an inability to protect yourself. So if you develop kidney disorders, what's going on in your life that you are feeling so vulnerable? Bladder disorders, the yin yang, bladder is the masculine, Fear run an inability to protect somebody else. So when you're developing bladder disorders, who is it that you don't believe you can protect? So this is what we did. We worked with her, what's going on in her life. And her child was going away to college. She was terrified he didn't have the emotional skill sets for necessary to do that. So take a look at this. She took leadership in her life dealt with her issues, dealt with her perspective, allowed her child to live his journey, <coughs> fail the way he needed to fail, do what he needed to do. All of a sudden, the cancer was gone and it never came back. Mm -hmm. Again, leadership. If we look at my why, my be, my do, just did it in a different way. Anything is possible. Do you want to be physically healthy? Let me tell you how to do this. And some of us have chronic disorders. I think most of them disappear when you do your work. But for those that don't, they can impact you minimally, or they can keep you stuck in a chair. What's your choice? What's your choice? 
We are leaders in our own lives, spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Feng Shui, phenomenal, phenomenal art form. I've done it for years in my own home and offices. When you walk into a home that is Feng Shui, the energy flows so freely. Guess what happens when you walk into an environment where the energy flows freely? <coughs> you flow freely. How many people do you know who have said to you, I have just decided to absolutely clean up my house. I am filling bags and bags of stuff and taking it out. <laughs> Amazingly, I feel so much better. <laughs> of course you do, because you cleaned. You cleaned out all the old stuff that you were holding on to in terms of physical possession. But what you end up doing is letting go of all the old stuff that you're holding on to inwardly. Our outside reflects our inside. And in health, our inside reflects our outside. So look at this, okay? How do you get lost in your life? Know what it is because we all have the same hooks. Do you get lost when children need you? Do you get lost when work is really busy? Do you get lost when nobody's in your love relationship? How do you get lost in your life? Know yourself. Emotional intelligence is not that I never have issues. Emotional intelligence is I know what my issues are. And an effective leader has an immense amount of emotional intelligence. The more emotional intelligence you have, the better and more effective a leader you are. You will never be an effective leader without emotional intelligence. I've had four companies in my life. One of my companies, my school, I had 19 years. I had 60 on my payroll. To lead 60 people, you best have a fair amount of emotional intelligence or you go crazy yourself. Okay? Emotional intelligence doesn't say I have no issues. It says I know exactly what my issues are, and when they show up, I know exactly what caused them and exactly how to work through them and come out on the other side. Emotional intelligence never says, as I used to say to my patients, they say to me, how come you have it all together? You're the only person in the world I know who has it all together. I do, it's over there in the back corner. It's all together, <laughs> it's over there. You can't I haven't have gotten rid of it, it's just over there. Because I don't choose to allow it to impact how I live my life. Mm -hmm. It shows up. More than once I wanted to suck my thumb and knock it out of bed. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know, call me tomorrow, I'll take some aspirin, don't come near me. You know, when I have eight patients today, or I've got four meetings today, there goes that good thumb. Down, uh, out yeah. of bed, there we go. And it's okay, I didn't fail, I was human. And what do you do? So take a look at this. You don't want to do survival. That's what you're doing when you allow yourself to get lost, when you allow yourself to do self-betrayal, and when you work hard to make yourself small. Now look at all of this. We have our Y, we have our B, and we have our do. Now that we've got all of this, even greater than us are the values we go through life with. And one of the things Lance teaches enormously, and I quote him because I absolutely believe in what he has to say. One of the things in our value system, as leaders, to be an effective leader, you have to look at the fact that you are in relationship. And if you don't know it, write down, what are the qualities you want in your ideal relationship with your partner, with your lover? with your spouse, whatever that may be. What are the qualities you want in your love relationship? Those are the qualities you want to bring in as a leader. For those of you who are in a little bit of shock, let me walk you through this. When you are in a healthy relationship, let me stress this, a healthy relationship, so most of us have tried the others, okay? So when you're in a healthy relationship, there is a willingness to have connection. There is a willingness to be seen. And there is a willingness to see. I want intimacy. I want to know you well. We were joking about something this morning, I don't remember what it was. Somebody made a comment to Liz. And I said, I love Liz. I love her enough so much that I know who she is and I know how she will respond. So whenever she responded a certain way, I said, that's Liz. 
I love her so much, I know where she's going to go with that. And how many of us say, oh, I love you, but what are they like? I have no clue. What hurts the feelings? I have no clue. If you truly love, you are present with, and you know someone as an effective leader, for one, I am going to acknowledge that everybody in my company, and if I'm a consultant, everybody in the company I'm consulting with, everybody has their own leadership. And an effective leader raises leaders. An effective leader brings people up. An effective leader sees the heart and the soul of the people they are working with. And in doing so, develop a healthy relationship with everybody in their employment or everybody in their company. And because I love you, I can say, "Huh, this isn't the right job for you. You are a square peg trying to fit in a round hole. It isn't working. A woman I worked with, she had somebody she was working with, an employee that didn't get along with anybody in the department. It wasn't working, and she said, I feel so bad because I can see his gifts. He's got so many gifts, but he doesn't work here. It doesn't fit in with my team. He doesn't fit in with this department. So what did she do? She saw him. She truly saw him. She went and spoke to several friends who were heads of other departments, found him a job in another department that did dramatically different work, that had a dramatically different psychodynamic in their team. He thrived. She loved him so much, she didn't say, come on, I'll help you fit in that hole. I know we can do it. She knew he doesn't belong here. Not because there was anything wrong with him, he just doesn't belong in this department. Let me love him enough to let him go, take him over to where he fits. He will thrive. I can bring in somebody else that I now know what to look for and what to see that does and doesn't work in my team and bring in somebody who can thrive here. That's an effective leader. Not because she taught somebody how to become small, but she taught somebody how to become big, <coughs> just not with her. See, this is effective leadership, okay? There are guideposts. The values are the guideposts of your, your why, your be and your do. Why anything is possible. Might be. I want to be an effective leader. So how will I do it? By being present and in relationship with everybody in my world. So that I don't give them false compliments so that I don't build them up knowing they are going to fail because they're in the wrong place. So I don't tell them they did that beautifully when I can see they just betray themselves by doing what they just did. And if you want me to love you, you have to want me to be honest with you. Not criticizing you, but honestly presenting to you what's going on or what isn't going on. Your leadership and your relationships always reflect you why you're being your due, always. And a leader does not motivate. A leader inspires. It is dramatically different. Because we want everybody with us to live their why, their be, and their do, we want everybody with us to come from in here, out there. We have this wonderful man here now who knows about true gardening for the best for the garden, the best for the plants, the best for the owner. So what happens here, he's going to live in his truth. The only way he can do it is in a healthy way. <coughs> healthy for the planet, healthy for him, and healthy for the world. All right, with everybody in it. We need to look at this, we need to see this. And how do we do this? Through inspiration more than motivation. The way we do this is, I'll motivate you. We're gonna give you a discount if you use solar panels. We'll give you a discount if you buy healthy fertilizer instead of chemical-based fertilizer. All right, great, I'm gonna get that, I'm just gonna save myself a buck. Versus if I inspire you, if you do it this way, not only do you save the planet, but you allow yourself to live in a healthy, energetic, 
environment. So we inspire them to come. And in inspiration, people get to live their passion. In inspiration, people get to live their spirituality. In inspiration, you're continuously calling them to become more and more of who they truly are. In motivation, you're causing them to live outside with some external motivator that has nothing to do with the inspiration that causes them to continuously transform. And I believe in transformational leadership because it really is continuously calling people to be more and more transformed into who they truly are. And with these values, if you're living your truth, you are going to have humor. I have a client I was talking to two weeks ago. She's a, extremely, a woman who has succeeded beyond in a man's world. And I said to her, she asked me, she said, one of my patients, one of my, my employees in the, my office said to me, I wish you would learn how to treat us halfway as well as you treat the patients. And she said to me, I don't like that. What's wrong with me? I said, nothing. But you do really well as a man who's disconnected from his heart and his soul. Mm. But there's no difference here. Anybody, male or female, living from their heart and their soul, living from their passion, living from their why we do, is going to have all of these strengths. It's going to have it. And she said to me, I want them to know that I love them. Her heart, you could see her heart. She didn't know how to show it. So tell me when was the last time you laughed at yourself at work? She goes, laugh at myself in front of people? I said, it's really the best way to do it. She said, she said I never laugh at work. I said, so tell me again how much you enjoy your job. I love my job. You love your job, but you never laugh. And you certainly never laugh at yourself. No, I would never do that. Mm. Say, okay, then I know where we need to begin. Yeah. <laughs> All right? If I'm going to be your mentor, if I'm going to be your coach, and you want me to teach you how to be an effective leader, start leading your life. Bring joy into it. Live from your passion. Live from your spiritual connection to yourself, to the world. And then look at what you can bring to the world. An amazing, amazing woman, amazing physician, doing huge things out of the box. But needs to connect to herself. In our values, in our relationships, what do you want in your most intimate relationships? You want to be respected by your partner. If so, you need to respect the people you are working with. You need to respect their humanity and recognize it. You may have told them this four times, but how many times have you told yourself four times to do something and you haven't done it? Welcome to humanity. So we need to respect the people we work with. We need to create a connection. We talked about connection this morning. Paula talked about it as well. Connection. If you connect with the people, I say under you, and I don't believe that term, but connect with the people you were working with. I had a meeting with somebody yesterday, and she said to me, I have such trouble with all these people. I'm trying to lead them, and they won't get behind me. <laughs> this is not the Pied Piper anymore. People you were working with will not get behind you. You cannot expect them to own their leadership and be leaders in your department, in your company, if you're asking them to get behind you. Leaders don't walk behind. You are one line. Your presence, your energy, your charisma, your knowing is what inspires them to live your vision and your dream. The leader has the dream. The leader creates a vision in how to achieve that dream. And to be an effective leader, you share your dream with the people who work with you. And you inspire them to follow your dream so that it becomes their dream as well. If you have people working for you who hate flowers, who hate gardens, who hate working outside, <laughs> they may put in an eight hours, but it's not a really engaged eight hours. <laughs> and they're not going to have the joy you can be with because they're surviving. You want somebody who believes your beliefs. You want somebody who isn't buying your vision because they want a job. 
You want somebody who ha doesn't have your vision. Their leadership isn't the same type of leadership. I have another whole talk on the five styles of leadership and the five archetypes of leadership, whatever you want to call it. All different types of leadership. But if you are the leader of a company or the leader of a department, know that what we're talking about here is bringing people in behind you so that they can walk right up beside you. And what happens is that as a leader, they now believe your vision, they have made it theirs. They are not your competition. They love the fact that your gift is this type of leadership. Their type of leadership may be, they're the ones that you can trust, will always have your back, they will take the details and run with them because that's what they love. They want to be in charge of details. Let them have a ball, that's not my strong point. Somebody else wants to be the leader in marketing because that's their gift, you let them be the leader. Of course, you're letting them know you're working as a team, but this is their strength. But you're the leader of the dream, you're the leader of the vision. That's an effective leader. And you get out there and you lead. But you do so with respect that their skills are different than yours. You do, do, you do so with connection. You know them so well. You know what's going on with them. When they're not themselves today, you know them well enough to say, is this what's happening? And you talk about it, you bring them back to their truth, you bring them out of their self-betrayal, and then you support them and you make it happen. So look at this, the confident leader. Confident leadership in and of itself. You know your why, your be, and your do. You've got it. You cannot be an effective leader without these. Your energy reflects each one of them. Your energy reflects who you want to be. It reflects why you're doing what you're doing. Anything is possible. Every one of us can take on our leadership and run with it. And it's going to look different in every one of us. Not wrong. Different in every one of us. You respond, you never react. People who react are people in defense. Mm -hmm. People in defense are people who see themselves as powerless or as victimized. Nobody's gonna get me, I can fight them. <laughs> who does that with somebody in fear? Somebody who's not in fear is not ready to protect themselves. You throw something at me, I'm gonna step aside. I'm not going into fear, I'm just gonna step aside. Somebody in fear is going to say, oh yeah, you think you can do that to me, let me take you on. And now here we go, they're trying to prove they're tough. You don't have to prove anything if you believe it. All right, so look at this. From a cellular level, you are creating your life. And as I said very briefly, because there's another whole talk I do on, on how your personality impacts your health. But take a look at this. That from a cellular level, if you were living your YB do, it isn't something you have to consciously think about. It's who you are. It's how you do your life. You take risks because you know without a risk, I have no more cliffs to jump. With no more cliffs to jump, there's no more of me to discover. I want to keep discovering strengths I never knew I had because they keep showing up. <laughs> you, own it, you own your innate leadership. You change your life. And in doing so, you change the world. Wow. Truly. Wow. Woo.